Okay, um, our first speaker that's going to come up is uh, quite a young gentleman, but he's uh, got a very impressive resume. His name is Federico Pastono, and he is a scientific educator, a social activist, computer scientist, blogger, media expert, and a fire, an aspiring filmmaker. Um, Frederick has written on, for various newspapers and blogs regarding a range of topics from science and technology to artificial intelligence and climate change. He's appeared frequently on radio and TV in Europe and the U.S., has hosted numerous podcasts uh, covering the impact of technology in society, activism, as well as science-related news. Uh, he is also in demand as a speaker at various universities and symposia and other events around the world. Frederico has a formal education in science and technology with a bachelor, for all you credentialists, by the way, uh, with a bachelor in science and computer science from the University of Verona, Department of Mathematical, Physical, and Natural Sciences. He's continued his studies by following courses at Stanford University uh, on artificial intelligence, machine learning, as well as many other subjects. And uh, I think what's most impressive for me, anyways, was in 2012, Frederico was accepted to the graduate studies program at the singular university NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley. A unique interdisciplinary, that's a big word, why don't you have to put a big word in there? Interdisciplinary, international, and intercultural experience, whose aim is to assemble, educate, and inspire a cadre of leaders who strive to understand and facilitate the development of exponentially advancing technologies and aptly focus and guide the, those tools to address humanity's grand challenges. That's such grand challenge just getting through that. Anyways, without further ado, uh, Federico, you're on. So, it has come to this. You, me, here. I was just told to make a dramatic entrance. So. <laughs> Hello to every one of you. Welcome, my name is Federico Pistono, and I come from an incredible country. A country that has been the center of civilization for over a thousand years, and has given birth to most of modern Western culture the arts, the opera. It was the birthplace of the Renaissance and Leonardo da Vinci, but also the church. Banks, the fractional reserve system, massive organized crime, fascism, we elected five times a Freemason who is under investigation for several criminal activities and has been accused of mafia collusion, money laundry, tax fraud, underage prostitution, and we just replaced him with an unelected man, leading member of the Bilderberg Group, former European chairman of the Trilateral Commission, and international advisor for Goldman Sachs. Hmm. So let's begin. Who am I, what am I doing here? Some of you might remember me from the radio shows I hosted about collaboration, positive thinking, and automation, and the Science and Reason video series on YouTube. But maybe not. Maybe you know me because I kickstarted a project called Zeitgeist Global Connect, where programmers kind of get together and build a free and open source distribution for activists to use without any knowledge of programming whatsoever, so they can, you know, start up a chapter very easily and just start doing stuff. Or maybe you know me because I gave the initial spark to what is now the central repository of essays, articles, and information about the movement, the TCM blog. So it started out as just an idea, and then shbam! We now have a kick-ass team, and with great people inside, and some of which will uh, speak to you today. And just recently, as mentioned before, I was accepted to Singularity University, so I'll be spending my whole summer at NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, and I'll try to solve humanity's biggest challenges together with other great, great bright minds from all over the planet. And the projects that will come out of this program will have to improve at least the lives of one billion people within the next 10 years. So that's a challenge. Most of you probably know as the founder of the co and coordinator, former coordinator of the Italian chapter of the Zeitgeist Movement, which I started about three years ago, and we've done some pretty cool things since then. Uh, we aired clips from the Zeitgeist film series on national TV for eight weeks straight. We did uh, strict activ activism, screenings, and free hugs, flash mobs, and all the good stuff I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah, even the police joined in. It was kind of nice. It was kind of nice. 
Uh, so just recently, though, we did something different. We organized a symposium where we opened up to other organizations and sustainability advocacy groups. We had a lineup of some 15 speakers and it all went beautifully. We spent a day together, ate lunch together, we discussed, we had dinner together, we started all sorts of collaborations. It was wonderful. This is, I think, our next step of evolution as a movement. You know, it's great to have these dedicated days like this one, where we kind of see what we have accomplished as a movement and who we are. But I think we can't just keep talking to ourselves. Uh, we need to open up to the rest of the world and let loose of the labels, as Peter mentioned before. So we should have, I think, week-long events where we get together with all sorts of other cool organizations and start a discussion. So I hope to see in the near future more of these events happening worldwide. Now enough of that. Let's get to the point. What am I doing here? I am here to tell you that robots will steal your job. Now that might sound preposterous to some of you or obvious to others. So which one is it? Preposterous or obvious? Well, I spent the better part of my last six months trying to figure it out, if you can believe that, and I came up with the following answer. Neither one of them. Or both, sometimes. Done. Oh, would you like me to elaborate? Okay. All right, let's get started. So, you are about to become obsolete. You think that you are special, unique, and that whatever you do is impossible to replace. Wrong. As we speak, millions of algorithms created by computer scientists and mathematicians are frantically running on servers all over the planet with one sole purpose. Do whatever you used to do, but better. So these algorithms are intelligent computer programs permeating the substrate of our society. They make financial decisions. They predict the weather. They suggest which countries will wage war next. Soon there will be little left for us to do. Machines will take over. This is a map of the human brain. Oh, oh wait, it's actually a map of the internet. <laughs> Oops. Does that sound like a futuristic fantasy? Maybe so. This argument is proposed by a growing yet still fringe community of thinkers, scientists, and academics who see the advancement of technology as a disruptive force which will soon transform our entire socio-economic system forever. According to them, the displacement of labor by machines and computer intelligence will increase dramatically over the next decades. And these changes will be so drastic that, and so quick that the market will not be able to abide in creating new opportunities for workers who just lost their job. Making unemployment not just part of a cycle, but structural in nature and chronically irreversible. It will be the end of work as we know it. <laughs> Obviously, mainstream economists discard such arguments. They actually call it the Luddit fallacy. Many of them don't even address the issue. In the first place, and those who do claim that the market always finds a way. As old jobs are replaced by machines, new jobs are created. Thanks to the ingenuity of the human mind and the need for constant growth, market always finds a way, especially in this ever-connected and globalized mass market we live in today. Now consider this, the exponential expansion of technology has been growing remarkably smoothly for a long, long, pretty long time. And not, I'm not talking about Moore's law, which states that the number of circuits, well, the number of transistors 
that can be placed in integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years. So integrated circuits actually are just a tiny fraction of the whole spectrum of change that pervades technological advancement. Uh, Ray Kurzweil notes that Moore's law wasn't the first to do so, but rather the fifth paradigm to provide accelerating price performance. Computing devices have been consistently multiplying in power per unit of time. 1890, US census, mechanical calculating devices, first paradigm. Turing relay-based Robinson machine, which cracked the Nazi Enigma code, and then CBS vacuum tube that predicted the election or the election of Eisenhower and transistor based machine um, that were used in the first uh, space launches and finally the fifth integrated circuits based personal computers which Kurzweil used to dictate the very essay that described this phenomenon in 2001 which he calls the law of accelerating returns. Now to get an idea of what exponential growth means, take a look at this graph right here. Okay, so, so this is technological capability, that's time. So these are the steps and this is a general idea of quantity and technological capability and investment. So this is linear growth. You go one, two, three, four, five. So if this extended to 30, I didn't make to 30 because you'll understand why in a second. But if you count from one to 30 steps linearly, it's one, two, three, four, five, you get to 30. If you do it exponentially, two, four, eight, 16, what do you get? One billion. 30, one billion. That's a big difference. I use this example all the time when I give talks around universities. Now imagine this water bottle. Okay, um, instead of water being inside, imagine, imagine it's, a, it's a cup of a petri dish or something, and you put bacteria inside to reproduce, and you give them food so they can, you know, multiply. Now, you know that in 60 minutes, it fills up the bottle, the whole thing. And every minute, they double in size. So it takes 60 minutes to fill the bottle, Every minute to double in size. Question is, after 55 minutes, what percentage of the bottle do you think the bacteria? Yeah, quarter, how much? 50? What? <laughs> Something else, what? 10, 10%? 200? Now, the answer is 3.125%. It's counterintuitive, I know, and that's because we think linearly, not exponentially. But imagine, 60 minutes is 100%. 59 minutes, 50%. 58 minutes, 25%. Then 12.5, then 6. Point, and then, yeah, it goes like that. So, we are not used to think exponentially, but that's how technology works. Now, a curve that explodes out of the normal graph looks like a straight line on a logarithmic plot. That's the same curve as, curve as before that was like right there. This is a straight line. It's the same curve, it's just changing the y-axis so that instead of having, you know, 5, 10, uh, 15, it has 5, 25, 125, 630, and so on. So as you go along, it increases the quantity exponentially. Um, you'll understand why we use logarithm graphs when we talk about exponential. There simply isn't enough space to draw the graph. It would just go right off the ceiling. So let's go back to the graph. With this knowledge acquired, you see the curve isn't a straight line. It's another exponential curve. This is the growth of computing over the last 110 years. So, in other words, what you're seeing now is exponential growth, which we know it's pretty fast, in the rate of exponential growth. It's a double exponential. Now, that's pretty fast. Computer speed per unit cost doubled every three years between 1910 and 1950, 
and then it doubled every two years between 1950 and 1966, and now it's doubling every year. Computer power isn't simply increasing, it is increasing faster and faster. We can already see the consequences of this today as technology progresses at an unprecedented rate. Computers used to cost hundreds of millions of dollars, required huge rooms for storage, cooling, maintenance, a lot of power. I mean, before I was born, computers were like, look at that ginormous thing, it's just... Now, they can fit in your pocket. They are thousands of times more powerful and they cost thousands of times less, even millions of times less. So, that's a billions fold increase in just 30 years. Remember, 30 steps, this is exactly what happens. Now, as we progress even more, the changes will be so rapid that we will hardly be able to keep up. Things will change dramatically in a matter of months, or weeks, or days, or seconds, or nanoseconds. <laughs> so, the long-awaited dreams of science fiction are becoming a reality. Or are they? And I'm going to tell you things that will blow your mind. <laughs> That's you with your mind blown, right there. I know now, there is always going to be that guy, you know, that guy. Doesn't matter what you say, and you know how people react differently to technology? So you tell them something amazing, they go like, no way, like, oh, you, you fucking kidding me, you believe that shit? And then there's that guy who's going like, yeah, I knew it. I mean, I didn't, but it's obvious, right? So, I'll go ahead and start with the examples, and you look around to see if that guy is sitting next to you. First, I have to make a confession. A confession. I said that um, robots will steal your job, but that is true eventually. Uh, the real threat isn't really some futuristic anthropomorphic robot. It's today, right now, and those are computer algorithms. How about software that predicts crime before it happens? like Minority Report, but without the drug abuse children in a tank to make it work. This is, this is working right now. And then we have facial recognition algorithms that predict what products you like based on how you look like. And brain scanners that eavesdrop your brain waves, your inner dialogue, by looking at the waves the patterns from your brain. Also, how about a mathematical equation that predicts with an accuracy of over 60% if a song is going to be a hit or not at the charts? Right there. Pretty simple. That's a score. Just plug in the numbers and you know if you're saying your song is going to sell or not. Now let's go one step further. How about a robot scientist It can generate its own hypothesis run experiments to test them, and then make discoveries without any human help. Oh, by the way, these things are you know, taken from some cheap art, uh, articles from some cheap newspapers. For instance, this is New Scientist, and the original publication is from Science Magazine. Even further, genetic algorithms that design and manufacture robots without any human intervention. In fact, MIT researchers have now taken a major step toward the goal of replicating the functions of a human brain by designing a computer chip that mimics how the brain's neurons adapt in response to information. Algorithms are catching up with us, and pretty quickly, I would say, faster than we can realize. Remember back in 1997 when IBM's Deep Blue challenged towards player, champion, Gary Kasparov. They said a computer could never, ever beat a human, the best human at chess. They said chess required high intelligence, understanding patterns, and adapt quickly to different situations. Computer can't do that. 
but it did. Deep Blue won. And what did people say after that? Well, you know, chess doesn't really require intelligence. It's just number crunching. Okay, computers will never beat humans at things that are not mechanical, like language and culture and pop references and things like that. Never. Now, this picture is from IBM's Watson in 2011, destroying the best human players ever at the game of Jeopardy. Uh, one that requires, uh, as I understand, because I'm not American, but I, vast knowledge and understanding and the, the intricacies and the nuances of the English language, puns, pop cultures, jokes, all of that. One, hands down. And what did people say after that? Well, language doesn't really require intelligence. <laughs> it's just blah, blah, blah. Now, how long before we understand it's just a matter of time? Now, a friend of mine advised me to break the tension a little bit in the middle of my presentation. <clears throat> so I asked him, okay, um, what do you propose? And he said, well, kittens and boobs. <laughs> I, I thought that was kind of cheap, so I, I went for something different. How about a shark? High-fiving a gorilla in front of an explosion. Awesome. You know what else is awesome? We have automated cars that drive hundreds of thousands of kilometers without a problem, with no human intervention whatsoever. They are perfectly safe and they even outperform the best human drivers. Now let's watch a little video. Since our work has focused on building driving cars that can drive anywhere by themselves, any street in California, we've driven 140,000 miles. Our cars have sensors by which they magically can see everything around them and make decisions about every aspect of driving. It's the perfect driving mechanism. We've driven in cities, like in San Francisco here. We've driven from San Francisco to Los Angeles on Highway 1. We've encountered joggers, busy highways, tall booths. And this is without a person in the loop. The car just drives itself. In fact, while we drove 140,000 miles, people didn't even notice. Mountain roads, day and night, and even crooked Lombard Street in San Francisco. <laughs> Sometimes our cars get so crazy, oh they even the right do uh, the little stunts. Oh, oh my god! <laughs> what? It's driving itself. <laughs> All right, that was the Google car. By the way, that was Sebastian Thrun from um, Stanford University who just opened up the course in machine learning, artificial intelligence, which I followed, and now he's going to teach for free online how to build the software to run an autonomous car. Ten weeks, and you know how to do it. Just follow the course. For free, obviously, and unlike us, these things, they can only get better as they get older. We have coordinated groups of autonomous robots that can do the job of building wor workers, constructing, for instance, in this case, a six meter high tower without any human intervention. And place it exactly where instructed by a control program known as the foreman. It, uh, it takes off and it flies over to pick up a brick. Uh, it makes sure that other vehicles that are flying with bricks are not in its way, so it, it uh, stays out of the way until it feels that it can move into the space. That's a research center in Switzerland, by the way, that's an Italian guy. <laughs> now we have a new and smart way of building houses too. 
typically it can take up to uh, from six weeks to six months to build a two-story house in the US or Canada, mostly because dozens of humans uh, do all the work. Now, well, take a look at this. This is today, okay, not in 20 years' time. This is today China. This is a time lapse of the construction of a 30-story skyscraper. And you can see there's a timer at the bottom right there. It's a skyscraper with all modern comforts. It can withstand earthquakes of magnitude nine has excellent insulation systems, smart system for air circulation, quality control, all that good stuff. There, uh, I don't, it's uh, the end, uh, you'll see, it, uh, we don't have, but, but it stops at 360. Okay, so that's pretty good, 360. A 30-story building in less than a year, not bad. Oh wait, those aren't days, 360 are the hours. <laughs> So yeah, 15 days to build a 30-story building. Now, this is what we can do today. Let's have a look at tomorrow, shall we? It is possible that within a decade, contour crafting, see it as a kind of uh, large-scale additive manufacturing, will have become so advanced, it's like one layer after the other, right? that we'll be able to upload a design specification and a massive robot will we'll just press print on our computer and this watch, watch this robot as it spits out a concrete house in less than a day. No humans required except for a couple of supervisors and designers, that's it. You don't think that's possible? Think again. 3D printing is already a billion dollar industry today. It's growing exponentially. It's going to revolutionize the way we think about manufacturing forever. We can print physical objects ourselves, both as individuals or as part of a research center. And I'm not just talking about toys, tools, simple objects for the house, although they're useful. I'm also talking about prosthesis, um, teeth, even human organs. They actually did a transplant and it works. And that, it was in Sweden. And again, the guy was Italian, but they, they never work in Italy, these guys. <laughs> I wonder why. Now, things become better, more reliable, cheaper, customizable, and personalized. More importantly, they are easily shareable, either with the marketplace similar to iTunes, Amazon, Android market, legally, or not. Either way, once the information is out there, you can't stop it. Once the, the technology is available, you cannot uninvent it. It's out of your control. So where does this lead us? I know some of you techno-skeptics will think this whole thing is just a fad and very little will change. On the other side, I know there are many techno-enthusiasts who believe that this will finally liberate us from this 18th century mentality that keeps us behind and instead will project us into a Star Trek-like future of abundance, wonder, and exploration. But before that, there is a very real problem it's addressing right now not in 10 years' time, not in 100 years' time, now. The following data is taken from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2011. Take a good look at this table. Now answer this. How many types of occupations were created in the last 50 years? There are seven main occupations listed. Yeah, it's office and building, construction, extraction, building. They make up 43.88% of the U.S. workforce. How many new types of jobs were introduced because of advances in technology? Not a single one. The reality is that new jobs created by technology employ a very small fraction of people, and they tend to disappear soon after they're created. They require a high level of education, flexibility, intelligence, and entrepreneurship. Most people haven't been trained to be like that. 
In fact, our entire educational system was created just after the Industrial Revolution with the idea of creating factory workers, manual jobs, repetitive jobs, not the kind of jobs that the new economy will require. So I have one simple question. What will the millions of middle-aged, unskilled workers do once they are displaced by technology? It's a simple question. I have discussed this with economists, entrepreneurship futurists, academics. Not a single one of them was able to give me a convincing answer. Technology is advancing simply too quickly for the newly unemployed to learn new jobs. In the past, we've seen automation cutting the workforce, but that wasn't really a problem because unskilled workers all gravitated towards other jobs, still pretty unskilled, like, I don't know, Walmart, and which it's easy to find a job there, although it's very unsatisfying, and I don't think it's uh, your life dream to work at Walmart. But if Walmart begins automation, which it will, competitors will have to do the same in order to stay afloat, stay alive in this competitive market. So there will be no coming back for the shopping industry. It is an irreversible process. The jobs replaced will not come back. They're gone. The same will happen for millions of drivers, construction workers, and many others. But having jobs removed, what will people do? So far, nobody has been able to answer that question. And the reason for this, I think, is that there is no answer. Not in this system, not in the way it's designed to work. The displacement of human labor in favor of automation will have a snowball effect on everything. With unemployment level as uh, 30, 40 percent, which will happen, the economy will collapse. Without a backup plan to adjust to a new paradigm, we can expect the worst. Civil unrest, riots, police brutality, general distress will continue to rise until criticals, critical levels are reached, at which point the whole socio-economic system will crumble Upon itself like a house of cards. This has negative consequences throughout the whole spectrum of the population and it's against the interest of everyone on the planet, even among the richest and wealthiest people. Even they don't want that, especially them. So I think if we want to solve this challenging problem of our time, we have to rethink our whole economic and social structure. Rethink our lives, our roles, our purposes, our priorities, and most importantly, our motivations. It's time for a paradigm shift, one that will radically revolutionize our social system. This is an excellent, an excellent book, by the way, by Herman Daly, great economist. We call it resource-based economy. He called it steady-state economy or Ecological economics, it's basically the same thing. Check it out. Awesome book. Have we ever considered the possibility that finding job replacement, no matter what, might be the wrong choice to begin with? Just saying. Have we ever stopped and wondered if the only possible economic systems are socialists and capitalists and everything else just lies in between? Have we ever conceived of the notion that maybe the need for constant growth and consumption isn't just ecologically unsustainable and physically impossible, but also diminishes the quality of our lives. Too often we treat things as separate subjects, not realizing the interconnected nature of our reality. This mistake has made us weak and vulnerable. Over the last 70 years, we have set the stage of our own demise. We have become increasingly discontent, the quality of our lives and relationships has fallen, and we have lost track of what really matters. Be happy, right? Not consume, be happy. Today, everything is amazing and nobody's happy. It's time to take a, to take a step back 
and think about where we are going. Now, like the great poet once said, time is a bitch. So I can't elaborate on this issue anymore because I'm out of time already. But luckily, I've written a whole book about it. What, did you think I really spent six months of my life just to prepare this presentation? So the book is called, yeah, Robots Will Steal Your Job. But that's okay. And the subtitle is, How to Survive the Economic Collapse and Be Happy. So in the book I explore what I've talked about in more detail and I go much further than I could in this presentation. Uh, the development of the book is quite interesting. I launched a campaign on a crowdfunding site and I received overwhelming support as well as many great ideas from different people around the planet. And then it went viral as my articles were published at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies and it went on Singularity Hub, IO9 and even on Italian national TV. So it was pretty good. Now, here's the plan. For the next two months, I'll retire in medieval monkness on a remote location in the woods to finish the book. That's me in a couple of months, by the way. Yeah, I look 15, but I'm actually older. You'll find it online, hopefully by June. I hope to be done by then. There is a website. It will be on Amazon, Lulu, iTunes. You can buy it and stuff. And Oh yeah, and there's also a free version. <laughs> yeah, Creative Commons license. Yeah, because we're here just to make a buck, right? Right, Peter? Where's Peter? Where's Peter? Yep. Peter! Damn you. <laughs> anyway, there is a guy who could have been a sellout millionaire and decided to give away his work for free. How about that? Hmm? <laughs> Him, like many others before him, and I suspect many more after. The world is changing, folks. Talk about motivation, huh? How about watching the world become a better place because of what you did? How about that motivation? We're all in this together. We might as well enjoy the ride. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that, Puerto Rico.